I don't see him here yet. Not yet. Okay. We have Graham Carlton from. Uh, Please let me know when we should start. And just a quick note, the meeting is being recorded. Okay. Thank you. When should we have our cameras on? Um, your camera is very blurry. Mine? Is that, yeah, Dale, uh, Dale, do you see, Dana, it's a bit blurry. I agree, yeah. Okay, let me see if I... How's that? That looks like a bedroom though. Yeah, you know, maybe it's some special effect. Soft focus, 1930s movie stars. <laughs> Is any of this better? No, nope. it's 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 you who are blurry, not the background. Right. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, let me try wiping my. Uh, oh, could be the lens camera. Any better? It's mm -hmm. not, so I'm guessing it might be your connection. Hmm. It's funny because it looks clear to me. Like I can mm -hmm. see myself and it looks clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it will sharpen up. If I'm coming, if my audio is clear and my shared yeah. screen is clear, then that's most important. Yeah. Your audio is great. Okay. <clears throat> there are a lot of people. So, um, uh, Dana, they'll just let me know when you think we should start. I'll keep watching to see when Michael joins. And then I'll bring him to the presenter. Great. I think we can go ahead and start. We can start. All right. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, a webinar that's organized by the Intersecretary Working Group on Hustle Surveys. Um, this is our, I don't know, number of one of the a number of webinars we've been organizing. Um, so just before we start and hand over to our speakers today, uh, just a, a couple words about the Intersecretary Working Group of Household Surveys. Uh, we are a group uh, that works on household surveys and also on survey integration with other data sources. So our group uh, consists of 11 international agencies that all have something to do with household surveys and 10 countries are with us. So we have three objectives. One is really to improve survey coordination at different levels, national, regional, international. And the second is really to uh, promote and encourage innovative survey approaches uh, approaches in household surveys. This is why we're here today. We have uh, Dana and Dale and other speakers with us uh, because this is a really interesting area that that I think uh, really fantastic for people to understand better what's behind. Uh, the third one is really we're here to advocate and we'll still continue to advocate for the importance of household surveys. Um, it is, it, it's always considered as old fashioned, but I think there are a lot of new elements we are trying to integrate then, and we are also in evolving. Uh, so I think it's really great to be here. Um, and thank you so much, Dana, for really approaching us. And it's really a great honor to have you and other speakers with us. And I open, so I invite everyone to look at the manual. So it is, uh, I revise the link uh, link to the so the, the I can also yes post uh, can I have a copy <laughs> to post the, uh, the link to directly to the menu uh, I opened it and I thought okay let me just have a quick look I've seen the earlier version and I just couldn't stop reading it it's so <laughs> nicely done it's so different from our the way how we used to write our menus so I think we I mean we're gonna learn from you it's really I cannot stop reading it really it's so nice um, with that, uh, I would like to hand over uh, to Dale, who is going to moderate the session. 
and it's all yours. Great, thank you so much, Howie. Uh, it's it's lovely of you to say that you couldn't stop reading it. That's great. We're, we are very pleased with how it looks um, and of course with the content. So welcome everyone. It's a privilege to have a part of your morning today. We're really delighted that you've chosen to spend some of it with us. We um, plan to give you good uh, value for your for your time. So thanks, thanks for tuning in. We hope that you'll be pleased that you did. Um, I'm just going to give you a thumbnail sketch of where we're going and then turn it over for, to Dana for the first presentation. So our our outline today, if you haven't seen it already, is to have Dana Thompson uh, begin by um, covering sort of a big big the big picture of what is gridded population sampling who uses it and when might it be appropriate. And uh, today, as Howie, Howie was saying, it's a, today is the sort of, we're considering it the uh, official launch date of this new manual, which was uh, sponsored, underwritten by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, it's, there's a corresponding website, Dana, I don't know if you put it in the chat or not, but it might be great to put it in the chat. And, Um, we wanted to have a chance to let you all know that the manual is there. It's freely available, that we're hoping that it will be not only um, a resource for you to use, but perhaps a resource to which you contribute. There's a, a section of uh, tutorials there that you can use to make a customized manual, and we hope that some of you will contribute to updates to some of those tutorials or additional tutorials. So we're hoping to begin to foster a community of practice, and we would be delighted to engage with some of you who are interested in participating in that and who have ideas about, about that as well. Perhaps Dina will, will touch on that as well. Um, so we're gonna, um, Dana is the author of the manual, I'm its editor, and we're going to hear from several other practitioners today from Sarah Ford from the US Department of State and from Michael Imohi from the um, Nigeria's National Bureau of Statistics. We're gonna hear about their experiences conducting graded population surveys. And um, then we'll have a time for questions and answers at the end. So um, do go to the website, grab a copy of the manual for your um, own purposes. And uh, please share um, this with friends, let others know about it. And uh, then we look forward to engaging with you um, both today and, and over time. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my friend and colleague, Dana Thompson, you know, um, Dr. Dana Thompson. And her, um, the focus of her research is identifying populations who are underrepresented in household surveys and other data and developing tools and protocols to improve population data accuracy. Um, you know that uh, household survey methods were established a long, long time ago, and uh, in some respects haven't haven't changed, and especially in low and middle income countries. And Dana's research is focused on methods to address um, decay in the accuracy of the surveys due to social shifts that modify household configuration and behaviors over the last four decades, including urbanization and uh, increased mobility. So Dana's helped pioneer the field of gridded population sampling, and this this new manual is a really terrific milestone, I think, in her contributions to the field. Um, a key component of improving survey accuracy is mapping deprived versus not deprived urban areas so that um, heterogeneous urban populations can be stratified in survey designs and can be reached not only by the survey teams, but by subsequent policies and interventions. And so toward this goal, um, Dana coordinates the Idea Maps Network, which is an initiative that integrates slum mapping traditions in order to map deprived urban areas routinely and to map them accurately at scale across countries. And her work there uh, includes evaluation of gridded population data set accuracy in cities and in slums to improve um, SDG 11 monitoring. So without further ado, here is Dr. Dana Thompson to talk about graded population survey. Thank you so much, Dale, for that. I'm going to get my screen up.
It really is such an honor today to be sharing um, designing and implementing gridded population surveys, the manual with step-by-step -step tutorials. This has been a labor of love um, that we've been working on for quite a while, and so it's just such a delight to be able to release it today. Um, I will just mention that there's so much that we cover in this manual, it's not going to be possible for me to talk about all of the guidance for gridded population sampling, but I do hope that this presentation wets, wets your appetite and you do go down and download it for your own uh, viewing. So I want to briefly start with my first gridded population survey, which I conducted in 2010 in the eastern DR Congo in an island called Ijwi. I had been invited with another with a team of students who were based at Harvard Medical or Harvard School of Public Health um, by a local administrator to conduct a demographic and health survey. And my role in the team was designing the survey. The last census in the DR Congo had been in 1984. That's still true today. And um, this the island was particularly has a particularly dynamic population. And so I had no idea, honestly, how. I was going to select a representative sample of the population without knowing the distribution. Um, so my undergraduate degree is in geography, so I put on my geography hat and thought, okay, this land scan data set that I knew about was fairly new at the time. I thought maybe this would be useful as a sample frame. And so um, I used it. It's uh, population estimates for the year 2000 and one by one kilometer grid cells. Um, I was able to select a representative sample of clusters. And I was able to look at those clusters over Google Earth imagery. I was able to segment the cells and create um, sensible boundaries for our field work. And we printed paper field maps based on Google imagery. And it actually went remarkably smoothly. And in the years since, and I've been involved with a number of other census-based and gridded population-based surveys, and I realized just how smoothly this initial survey went. But that really sparked my um, desire to create tools that make it possible for non-GIS and spatial experts, a lot of whom are in the world of household surveys, to be able to conduct gridded population surveys. So I worked on the grid sample R algorithm, which has now been replaced by gridsample.org, um, which are tools that are described in the manual. So I'm not the only one that stumbled into gridded population surveys, and maybe you're finding yourself at the seminar because you're stumbling into this as well. Dale and myself and some colleagues did a review of the literature in 2020 and looked at which gridded population surveys have been conducted across low and middle income countries and identified at least 40 and or over 40 in at least 29 countries that had been conducted to that point. Um, and there's surely been many more today. They've been conducted across all different types of household surveys from routine multi-topic surveys by governments um, academic research and evaluations, opinion polls by government and um, consulting firms, as well as rapid needs assessments by teams like the World Food Program. And so we're going to hear about three of these applications today. What exactly is gridded population sampling? It's very simple. It simply refers to any sample frame that is derived from a gridded population estimate rather than a traditional population census. And so this means that gridded population sampling can refer to a whole bunch of different um, you know, ways that we do surveys in the field, survey designs. I'm just going to show a few different actual survey maps that were used in field work for gridded population surveys. Um, some things that you'll see in common are that, in at least in all of these examples, the sampling units are, look, are about the same size as an enumeration area and generally are a a grouping of small grid cells, in this case, 100 meter grid cells. Um, you can actually just sample grid cells directly, and you can also take gridded population estimates and, and use those estimates to update, say, enumeration area boundaries, so they have follow roads and rivers and other natural features. But most commonly, um, in the settings where we're doing gridded population surveys, we don't really have very good existing enumeration area boundaries. And so we're going to be using these multi-cell gridded units instead. And you'll see that they intersect roads and buildings and properties. Um, all of that's all manageable to deal with in the field. And you'll also see that they don't align with roads and natural features. Um, they usually do are contained by administrative units, though. 
So teams of all different backgrounds and skill sets of different survey designs have been able to implement gridded population surveys across contexts. So check out the manual. It's available here on this website. Um, we try to make it as concise as possible. It's a printable PDF. We also have tutorials there, as Dale mentioned. You can filter through the more than 25 tutorials that we have now based on the survey step, the skill set of your team, or the survey design that you're using. They're purposefully designed as Word documents so that you can download them and edit them and hopefully combine them into your own bespoke field manual. And we hope that if you create any new content to fill in gaps or make any modifications that you will let us know through the website. And the purpose of this whole project of the tutorials and the manual is to provide a general overview of gridded sampling that enables you to decide whether or not gridded population sampling is even appropriate for your survey and to easily plan and implement your own gridded population survey. The manual covers population and household probability surveys. We don't cover enterprise surveys or any other kind of gridded um, data. It's designed specifically for survey practitioners who are already comfortable with census-based survey methods. And it's meant to enable you to make end-to-end -end decisions throughout a gridded population survey workflow. I'm going to briefly address some of the concerns and myths, since this might be kind of why you came to this seminar, and tell you when gridded sampling is and is not appropriate. And so the first thing, I, I hear people talk about gridded population sampling as a spatial sampling approach. And I just want to underscore that this is not spatial sampling. This is population sampling based on population estimates. Um, people often who are concerned before they do a gridded population survey about how they're going to deal with these gridded sampling units that, that don't align with natural features and what they're going to do when a PSU intersects buildings or properties. And just to rest assured that it's entirely feasible to implement um, a survey with these gridded units if you have basic map reading skills and tools. And there are simple protocols to deal with buildings and properties that are intersected. For example, what I always do is if a building on the north or eastern edge of a sampling unit is intersected, then it will be included with the sampling unit. Or if it's on the south or western edges of this uh, edges, it will be excluded. And so that will always ensure that buildings are only ever counted in one cluster. The cost of a gridded survey is often a question mark of all of the surveys that I'm aware of um, and, and uh, um, evaluations that I've done. Gridded population sampling also always comes in at the same cost as a census-based survey or oftentimes more affordable because we're using designs that um, only require one visit to the field and so we can speed things up a bit um, and save time and money in the field. When is gridded population sampling appropriate? Um, it is used most often for surveys that are in conflict zones or other dangerous areas where we want to minimize the time our field staff is spending in the field. Also, when the only other available census, uh, other available sample frame is from a census that's outdated or inaccurate. When the setting is really dynamic and complex, for example, a fast growing urban environment, or when the survey did design team wishes to stratify based on an environmental or geographic characteristic. Um, for example, I've seen surveys stratified by air pollution concentration. And while any survey can be stratified by some kind of spatial data, um, gridded population sample frames are always based on spatial data. So they're very easy and straightforward. Um, it's a good candidate if you need to stratify based on geography. So most of the concerns and myths, I wouldn't actually be concerned about myself. But the one thing that I am concerned about and that I think others should be concerned about when doing a gridded population survey is the accuracy of the available gridded population data sets that, you, that you're using. Um, this is my main concern. Modeled gridded population data are models. And as statisticians say, say all models are inaccurate, but some are more useful. So there will be inaccuracies at fine geographic scale in these gridded estimates. For every grid cell, you, it will not be a, a perfect, uh, perfectly accurate. But that said, the, the, despite this variation and any local inaccuracies in gridded population data sets, 
those are still more useful for sampling than when you have a, an outdated or inaccurate census. Um, and the reason is, is that gridded population estimates, a well-modeled gridded population estimate will incorporate information, for example, about building footprints and, and density of population. And you'll get a correct distribution or a more or less accurate distribution of the population in areas where there's been new settlement or new growth in a way that you wouldn't in an outdated or an accurate census. And as long as that distribution is accurate, you can still draw an accurate sample of the population. And so this is why um, those, the desire, it's desirable to use a gridded population sample in settings with an outdated or an accurate census. There are times when gridded sampling is probably not appropriate. Um, when you have a very small survey coverage area, for example, one village or one neighborhood, you probably can derive your own sample frame that's more useful than a gridded estimate. Uh, when the sample team doesn't have reliable or electricity or internet, for example, in a conflict zone, or the survey team is really unfamiliar with the most basic mapping tools, for example, Google Maps or Google Earth, then you probably don't want to use gridded sampling because to create the sample frame and draw samples and create maps for your field team, you need some basic internet and some basic mapping tools like Google Maps. Also, if, if a census was recently conducted and it's publicly available and widely trusted, there's really no reason to do a gridded population sample. You, you'll want to do a standard census-based sample because those field referenced data are always going to be more useful and reliable and accurate than a model data set. So I want to provide some guidance around which gridded data sets you should use for gridded population surveys. Um, there's unmodeled gridded population estimates where data are directly disaggregated from census administrative boundaries to small grid cells. And then there's lightly and highly modeled um, simple algorithms and advanced statistical models. Basically, you want to ensure that your a, a good gridded data set is either lightly or highly modeled and incorporates a data set like building footprints, which captures very fine scale population distribution fairly accurately. So we do not recommend the use of an unmodeled data set like the gridded population of the world by CSIN um, at University of Columbia. And until recently, LandScan Global, which is produced by the US government, and WorldPOP Unconstrained, which is not constrained to settled areas, were the, these were the only available gridded population data for many of the last um, 15 years. And so a lot of the existing gridded population surveys have been conducted with these data sets. Um, so they are viable in a certain way for surveys. They've been used before. But in the last two years, there's been a number of new gridded population data sets and a huge evolution um, in available data that's come online. And so there's a whole bunch of new gridded population estimates that are even better and that I would recommend for um, use in household surveys and other field-based work. So hey, my recommendation- Can I interrupt for just one second? Um, sure. There's a warning at the bottom of your screen. Could you close that so we can see your whole slide? Okay, um, I don't see that warning. Teams.microsoft.com. Oops. I'll stop sharing and reshare. How is that? Okay. Yeah. And then um, there was a button beside that that said hide for hide the warning, I think. Thanks. Oh, goodness. Just covering a crucial thing on the slide. All right. Are you seeing my slides clearly now? Yes. <clears throat> yes. You can go back to presenter. It's still there. So there's a hide button besides yeah, stop sharing. Yeah, you can just. Unfortunately, it's not showing. Okay. Is, it's... is that better? That's perfect. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, back to the data sets web. that, yeah, oh, no great, problem. Great, the data great. sets that I, I do recommend um, are the human, the high resolution settlement layer, which is produced by Facebook or now Meta. The global human settlement layer, which was just recently re-released re by the European Commission at 100 meter uh, scale and is amazing. The world pop constrained to settlement data set. Um, this model in Africa uses building footprints, but building footprints are not available outside of Africa. So I would only use that data set in African countries. Um, and then LandScan HD, 
just hot off the press and also grid three, which is still always coming out with new country level data sets, um, all are lightly or highly modeled and use building footprints and tend to be pretty good options for a gridded population survey. So walking through a typical survey workflow, there's very few places actually where gridded sampling will differ from a census-based survey. So let me just explain what those would be. In the survey design, when you're um, hiring staff at the beginning in the, in the planning phase, you might want to hire a GIS staff person for a gridded population survey, given the amount of reliance on spatial data and um, production of maps and use of navigation tools. But that said, there are definitely teams that have done gridded population surveys without having a GIS person on staff. And so it's possible and we provide some guidance in the manual about that. Um, the sample selection is where the main differences are with a gridded survey. You'll use different tools than your typical census-based sample to create a sample frame and draw your first stage sampling units. You'll also likely want to aggregate or segre uh, segment sampling units that either have far too many households or far too few households when you observe them in satellite imagery. Um, and so you'll want a GIS person to hopefully help with this. An alternative, if you don't have a GIS person, um, is to create a backup sample and then randomly select from your backup sample when you drop a sampling unit because it has too few habitable buildings in it. When you prepare for field work, you need to produce field maps, either paper and or digital maps, um, and you'll need to manage some spatial data. And so this is where the GIS person becomes quite useful. Your field team will need to learn how to do some basic navigation with apps on their phone or using paper, printed paper maps to get to the PSU and to move around within the PSU or the primary sampling unit. Um, I recommend that the field staff also mark up paper or digital maps if they observe roads or buildings that are different than the map maps that they're provided. Um, that just helps with accuracy on your side and you'll need your supervisors to be able to monitor any of that spatial data coming in. So for the most part, that's actually where the divergence between gridded population sampling and a typical census-based survey ends. Like from there on out, the survey is exactly the same. You design your questionnaire, you evaluate your questionnaire before you go to the field, collecting data, calculating indicators, et cetera, are all the same. I have highlighted the calculation of sample weights is possibly different. Um, the, sample for, the sample weights formula is exactly the same. It's just that in a gridded population data set, you have population estimates, and often you're using household counts or estimates in your formulas. And so you need to use like an average household size to translate population into estimated households. So those are the only differences that you will expect. The manual for simplicity talks about six survey designs that are available for gridded population sampling. The first four are ones that you will be familiar with and can be done with a census sample frame. Um, so design one is a typical multi-stage sample where you do a, a select small areas, you do a detailed listing of households, and then sample those households. Design two is essentially the same thing, it's just that the detailed listing is replaced by a very quick listing where um, there's no interaction between the listing team and households, and you assume that front doors of dwellings and apartments um, are the same as the equal one household, and that you just list the front doors. Not to, it's not recommended. Um, but it does get done in practice. Design three is a two-stage two sample. You select small areas, but you do the sampling of households in the field using some kind of random walk technique. And design four um, is doing a building simple random sample using a tool by Epicentra. I don't have time to go into it now, but definitely check out the manual if this is of interest to you. It's a, it's a way to um, reduce time in the field and be able to do all of your work in one field visit. The last two designs are only possible with gridded population sample frames. And that's because we use the small grid cells to as part of the sample frame. The first is an area micro census where you interview everybody in a small area, usually defined by a grid cell. And the second one um, is a type of, of a quota sample, which I'll talk about in a minute. I just want to briefly mention beforehand that we have scored all of these designs based on accuracy, precision, and affordability using a 
least to most desired scale. And generally speaking, most survey designs are equivalent in terms of balancing these things um, it's, it's in some way. But the last design, the area micro, the two-stage area micro census design, we think is actually does a better job than most survey designs in terms of balancing accuracy, precision, and being affordable. And if you're still trying to wrap your head around that, um, the national statistical agencies or academics tend to value accuracy and precision. That's why they often choose design one with the detailed listing, whereas a rapid needs assessment or a polling firm um, really values having an affordable, quick turnaround time. And so they might um, value design three more and, and use that instead. And I just want to, again, emphasize that design six is worth looking at. Um, this it maximizes overall accuracy, precision, and affordability, and I'll show you an example of it in just a second. So here's a map that you saw earlier that could have that could be used in any of these first four designs. It's a um, typical sampling unit of 100 to 250 households. This is an image of a grid cell that has been sampled and then segmented along a road. Um, and this would be useful in a one stage area micro census design where all of the households in that very small area would get included. And this might be 10 to 15 households. And here is an example of what a two stage area micro census sampling unit might look like. Um, generally, it's the size of a typical enumeration area with at least 100 households, but it's segmented by the original grid cell, usually 100 by 100 meter grid cells. And those cells are ordered at random. So in this, in this example, the ordering starts at 140 is the smallest number. And the process is that the interview team goes directly to the field. We don't do a listing. They go directly to the field and they interview all of the households in that first cell. And if they meet or exceed their target number of households per sampling unit, then they stop. But if they haven't, then they go to the next cell. And so that this case, it would be 141. They interview all the households. Um, again, if they meet or exceed the target households, they stop. And so in this way, it's kind of like a quota sample, but you have very clear segments that can be incorporated into a, um, and a, used with a weight, a sample weight and make um, reliable estimates about the population. And so it's a, an excellent, um, designed to use if you need to do one visit to the field. It's been used um, very successfully by World Food Program, which is the first team I've seen using this design. So I'm just about done. Um, I'm, I know I'm getting close on time. Just want to say that for each of these survey designs, we spent a lot of time detailing the design itself. We provide a sample weights formula that helps you to translate that population count into households and deal with any other um, specifics to that design. And we also, for each design, provide a real world example where you see the toolkit that was used by the implementing team and the skill level of that team. And with that, I'm going to put a pause on it, but feel free to reach out to me, um, email through my website, on Twitter, um, or be in touch at gridpopsurvey.com. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dana. That's terrific. Super helpful. And we have some good questions coming in. So we'll hear from you again later. Rest your voice for a few minutes. But uh, um, in our itinerary now, we're going to hear next from Dr. Sarah Ford from the US State Department. Um, Sarah is a statistician and technical advisor on international survey design and data analytics for the US State Department. She has over 20 years of experience in survey design mixed methods research, statistical analysis, including work experience in 20 countries. Before joining the State Department, she was the senior researcher at uh, the Demographic and Health Surveys Program with Avenir Health. I'm going to mangle the pronunciation of this word, but she was a PCI scholar at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria and a research assistant at the Urban Institute. Sarah's PhD is in demography and sociology from UCAL Berkeley. Sarah, thanks for joining us today. Good morning. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm going to try to share my slides now. Are those visible? They're coming. Yes, we see them. Thank you. 
Could okay, you also, thanks. oh, you got it. You got the little thing at the bottom, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and to share results of work on gridded population sampling in Uruguay conducted jointly with Matthew Kerwin. We both work in international survey research at the State Department, as was mentioned. However, the views I'm expressing today are my own and not necessarily those of the US government. This talk is a brief overview of a study that we conducted in late 2019 and is based on an article that we recently published in our personal capacities shown here. So I think after Dana's really excellent talk, there's probably not much need for uh, motivation for the study, um, but just to say that when we're dealing with rapid international face-to-face -face surveys, you know, whether it's for health, humanitarian, public opinion purposes, there are a number of sampling challenges that we face, such as the ones that are shown here. This cert list certainly is not exhaustive. But these tend to be compounded by the lack of time for a pre-enumeration process of the type that you might see in a major household survey. At the time we planned our study, gridded population survey sampling appeared to offer a number of advantages that Dana just discussed. However, we could not find literature comparing what we as survey researchers were ultimately interested in, which is really the accuracy of the results derived from an open source gridded population sampling approach compared to a traditional census-based sampling. So we designed a survey experiment that I'll briefly describe. Turning to the methods, it's a little bit difficult to test, right? Because rapid turnaround surveys often study outcomes like health or public opinion that really fluctuate over time. So if we run two public opinion surveys side by side, it can be unclear which one is closest to the true population parameter of interest. But voting intentions to some extent can be benchmarked externally. So we set out to find a good case study. We wanted to work in a country where they had free and fair elections, such that an opinion poll might reasonably predict the outcome. We preferred an environment where face-to-face -face surveys were the gold standard, at least prior to COVID, and, and this was prior. Although I think it's natural to bring gridded population sampling to the most challenging environments where censuses are outdated, we thought that for our purposes, a good case study might be a country with an already very strong sampling frame, a, a really solid census. In that way, if a gridded population survey were to succeed or to even be equal in such an environment, then perhaps the method would be suitable in countries where the reference data were lower quality. Ultimately, we selected Uruguay, a country with free and fair elections and excellent existing population reference frames. Our experimental setup was fairly straightforward. We fielded two pre-election polls simultaneously prior to the first round of Uruguayan presidential elections in 2019. To ensure comparability, almost every aspect of survey implementation was held constant. We used the same reputable firm uh, to work with for both studies. The questionnaires we used were the same. Uh, even the professional interviewers overlapped between the two studies as much as possible. The only major difference was in the sampling strategy. One was census-based, which I'm calling traditional, and the other was a grid sample. Additional implementation details are shown here, and I'm, I'm happy to share more in Q&A. So at right is the population surface that we used for Uruguay, which is from the World Pop program and contains very high resolution population densities. I thought it was interesting just now to see in Dana's presentation that there are even better surfaces, but when we designed this three years ago, this was the, really the, the state of the art. Notably in Uruguay, the population is heavily concentrated along the coastal south, and by and large, as you can see here in blue, the interior of the country is sparsely populated but it has 17 regions or departments making traditional stratification by region and urban rural residents really challenging. So a bit about our workflow. Um, first, of course, we stratified the population. As I mentioned, you know, this might typically be urban rural by region, but because Uruguay is unique, 
there were some modifications that we and the firm each made to our designs that I'd be happy to discuss in Q&A. Once we had our custom strata, we wanted to use the R package, but gridsample.org offered some power of supercomputing that made it a lot faster. And so we chose to upload those to gridsample.org to create and list single cell units to our specifications. And then I use that program to customize and draw a randomized sample of clusters from each stratum with probability proportional to the estimated size that was modeled from that surface. And something I wanna emphasize about this process is, you know, of course the technology underlying grid sample and the world pop surfaces and other surfaces is relatively recent. But the overall approach for us was really similar to a stratified two-stage randomized sample design that you might find in a major household survey like NICS or demographic and health surveys. However, within each selected cluster, we chose the random walk approach. We did not do a pre-enumeration and I can provide more details on the implementation. But then for both surveys, I created weights using a scale those who are undecided but leaning toward a candidate as actual voting intentions, which is common in the survey election prediction literature. Turning to the results, uh, here we see the actual outcomes indicated by a black dot for each main candidate. The blue square indicates regular survey results and the green triangle, the gridded sample results, and the bars are 95% confidence intervals. from the Broad Front Party won first place with 40% of votes, while Louis Lacayapu from the National Party was runner-up with 29%. Two other candidates shown here placed over 10% of votes, and then candidates that placed under 10% were grouped together into other. Uh, just as an aside, because no candidate won an outright majority, voting proceeded to a runoff election, but that's not part of our study. So broadly speaking, the results between both surveys, um, you could probably see looked quite similar, but which one performed better? Well, there are many ways to compare accuracy of results from something like elections, and we use three classic approaches. First is the accuracy at predicting the winner, and that was 40.5%. Here we see that both surveys overestimated the vote share but that the gridded sample was slightly closer by 0.3 percentage points. However, both the traditional and the gridded population sample survey contained the true result within their margin of error, so we counted this as a statistical tie. Second, we might look at the margin between first and second place, and the actual result was 11%, and the gridded population sample got a bit closer to that result. Third, as survey implementers, we often look at the root mean squared error of estimates. And in this case, the gridded population sample was slightly lower than the traditional sample. So in sum, um, while you know, it was not overwhelming, but the gridded sample really performed slightly better on two out of three metrics and then tied on the third. I'll share my perspective on challenges and advantages, um, having tried this method now for the first time. First, at least in urban areas, you know, the census-based sample uh, clusters were almost perfectly bounded by city blocks. And I think that was intuitive to the interviewers. Whereas, you know, in the gridded sample, there were often partial blocks in cities, there were cutouts. And while it was ultimately fine, um, it did pose some challenges when interviewers were sort of used to circling the block for a random walk. But when Matt and I went out and walked, you know, the test clusters with the interviewers, I could actually see how well that they could look at the satellite image, look up at the roof, at trees, at, you know, other landmarks, and they could tell exactly where they were and where they needed to turn around. 
Then I recommend that samplers draw at least a few extra backup clusters in each stratum in case of error in grid cells, and then randomly select which ones to try first. In our case, despite a satellite review of all of the satellite images, there were two clusters out of 100 where we ultimately had to substitute. Um, on the positive side, you know, one real advantage is the open source method and frame. We really appreciate that this is a scientifically transparent method and not a method that charges us every time we want to use it. Then this native GPS enabled approach, uh, first it more easily enabled the firm to pre-review where interviewers might walk and where they might travel to. And then it also allowed the firm to audit the interviewer paths more easily where they actually walked. And as we know, interviewer discretion is itself associated with survey error. So that seemed to have advantages. And while we you know, implemented both surveys at the same time, we certainly expect improved speed in many contexts. So in summary, our gridded sample survey performs slightly better than a traditional sample, even under conditions that were, I think in relative terms, nearly ideal for a census-based survey. Of course, we cannot universalize from a single case study, but to me, this is a solid proof of concept that gridded population sampling is a viable alternative, particularly in light of the other advantages of gridded sampling. We still hope to test it and hope to learn from other testing in other contexts, but it appears to be a promising approach for rapid surveys in low and middle income countries writ large. Thank you, and if you'd like more information, here's the citation to the article as well as how to contact us. Thank you, Sarah. That was crystal clear, super helpful. I can see already that there's one question we'll come back to you later, but Carolina Donavaro at WHO is asking if you compared the costs of those two methods. So um, do you want to address that now or do you want to wait for, why, why don't you just go ahead? Let's just knock sure. that out of the way. Well, because we actually contracted uh, this as one entire study, it wasn't really possible to compare the costs between the two because it was, you know, it was rolled into one. But we can certainly see that the speed in and of itself would save money as long as the, the grid cells are accurate. You know, if you start sending interviewers out to cells in the middle of nowhere, right, and then they have to turn around, that would start to be expensive. And I'm happy to chat more about it. Thank you, Sarah, that's great. Terrific, next we're going to hear from Michael Amohi from Nigeria. Michael is a Nigerian himself. He started to work with the Federal Office of Statistics back in 1986, when I have to say the music was a lot better than the music that we have today. Uh, he backed an award, he received an award of excellence in 1995. He was a desk officer at the UNFPA programs to the government of Nigeria for uh, 12 years, national chairperson on a subcommittee for monitoring and evaluation. He worked as a maternal and perinatal child surveillance response reviewer. He was the first to um, set up a spotlight initiative for gender-based violence analysis in the workplace. Uh, for the Statistical Bureau, and he designed a national template for data collection uh, uh, on GBVCIMS with the support of the EU. He led a team on national health accounts for the Bureau in collaboration with the Federal Ministry of Health team and WHO from 2014 to 2021. He is a consultant to the British Counseling on Mapping of Nigeria Creative Industries in a Lagos pilot study. Um, he was a member of the Grid3 Nigeria team and um, he was the team lead on uh, gridded um, smart survey nutrition Kaduna pilot, which he's going to talk to us about here in just a moment. He led a Ministry of Interior National Study on enhancing Nigeria internal security for effective protection of oil and gas facilities, a member of Violence Against Prohibition of Persons Report Committee, participated in several national studies in the Bureau and in Nigeria, attended international conferences and workshops. He was the Bureau's Vice Persons, uh, Chairperson of Sports, and um, their bureau uh, won three laurels and several medals ever, uh, the first in the history of the office while he was in that position. Michael retired as uh, head reproductive 
health officer in the bureau uh, in late 2021, and they've hired him back uh, now um, as a consultant. He's working again for the National Bureau of Statistics. We're delighted to have you with us, Michael, and we're looking forward to hearing um, about your experience using graded population sampling in, in Nigeria, specifically in the state of Kaduna for the, the nutrition survey recently. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Dale, and thank you all, and welcome to this uh, graded, uh, graded survey approach. I'm speaking from Nigeria. I would appreciate if Chen can help me to display the uh, my presentation. I'm having issues here with my laptop, and it's been going on and off. Can that be done for me, please? Okay, thank you. Yes, so I'm speaking from Nigeria. My name is Michael. My profile has just been read by Deroda. Thank you so much. Uh, in, in 2020, we, we embarked on the Kaduna Graded Smart Survey, and uh, it was signed in by Nigerian government. It was endorsed by Nigerian government and uh, Siri so Bidon Life, the DG Siri so Life, uh, Dr. Kana, was also a member of the team, and he was the one also running the Nigerian Smart Nutrition. So, and uh, other states, other uh, stakeholders like the MPOPC, the National Population Commission, National Planning, uh, the Bureau of Statistics itself, uh, Cardinal State Bureau of Statistics, and other stakeholders were all involved. Minister of Health, CBN, were all involved in the assignment. And they all took part from the beginning to the end. So the presentation outline, the presentation outline are as follows. When to use graded sample uh, method, uh, survey method, the pre-feed enumeration process, mapping, Navigation uh, app, digital digitized paper field map for each PSU, the open uh, data kit, ODK, local guide, data quality assurance, ethics, informed consent form, and team compensation. So we move on, we move on to the next. To the next, please. Thank you. So actually, when do, do we use graded sampling? And if it's helpful, if it actually helps during severe economic crisis, I will say that graded sample, graded sampling is best used when census is beyond 10 years. And uh, during severe economic crisis, graded method is best used. And the approach is usually bottom-up approach, which allows for predictions using recent surveys to improve access to data. Comparison within smart pilot and survey in, in, in Kaduna. The, the methods that were used. The graded approach, that is uh, gridsample.org, is a geospatial modern GIS application used to select probability pro proportional to size, PPS sample. But in the traditional method, which I call here the standard Nigerian method, or traditional method, use of combination of simple random sampling systematic random sampling to select and uh, the study units is being used alongside uh, the PPS. So the GIS approach is unique 
with a degraded approach. In the great approach, outright elimination of uh, inaccurate handwritten maps is carried out because there is no handwritten maps. Everything is Google based. But in the traditional approach, the handwritten maps were being used, the hand drawn maps were being used, and which leads to inaccuracy in the, in the PSU. In the sampling, uh, in, the, in, in the field of survey. And uh, the area of coverage, or in fact, the acute area, is 100 by 100 meters and it's unique to all the enumeration areas. But in the usual enumeration area, the output area varies based on residential and, uh, and it's and it's uh, subject to to updating. And uh, when you get to the field, and most times when the population is not enough, you start doing adjoining EAs, you combine one or two EAs together to now get the expected population that you want to converse. And uh, in the area of imagery, all elements within the location are captured if you are carrying out uh, the graded approach. All elements within the areas, within the location of the survey, are captured since it's Google based. And uh, we are, if, you are, if, if we are onto the traditional method, establishments in the EA uh, map, the one that is hand drawn, you will be capturing establishments uh, by sector, household, institutions, mocks, and others. But in the imagery, roads within the areas are boldly, are boldly captured. All the elements within, within the enumeration areas is being captured using the graded approach. Can we move on, please? Yes. So in the pre-feed enumeration, using the graded approach, like I said, graded approach is highly unique. It's a highly, it's a high resolution mapping tool are being used. High resolution mapping tools are being used. And the maps are being printed. The imagery is being printed from the satellites. That is uh, through the open uh, Google map using uh, ArcGIS. QGIS and Google map. So this map is being printed. The, the map of the whole area is being printed and is, is, uh, uh, is being mapped into polygons, into different uh, enumeration areas. And uh, we now have feed papers. That is feed maps will not be carried along. Um, but in the standard or the, the traditional uh, approach, information like uh, the, the having uh, satellite imagery is not there. It is a sketch map of the area that was being used to trace the location. And, and uh, the during mapping, you're using the graded approach, you, we, we, we have to use the map.me. These are guides that will lead you to, that, we, that, that, that led us to, to the uh, enumeration areas. It's an application. It will lead you to the PSU. And uh, it led us to the PSU. And we also use the SW map application to navigate within the PSU during the field work. And this is a guide that if you are leaving your with the animation area that has been mapped from the Google Apps. If you are pulling out, the SW map will give you a sign that you are leaving, you are moving out of your enumeration area. Which means there is no way that you that you will be covering another EA unknowingly because you'll be well guided. But if you are using the, the traditional uh, uh, modern, since you're using the map, 
if you're out of the admiration area, you will not even know. And these are the gaps. These are the gaps. Because you'll be going along with just the map. You keep sketching, sketching, either you sketch rightly or not, you 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 pass it on to the your to, 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 to a future person going to the admiration area, if that area is also uh, been uh, selected for to, to, to be canvassed for a future survey. Then we move on to uh, uh, called, digitized paper, that is a feed map for each PSU were produced in the course of, uh, uh, before going out to the feed using the graded approach. The digitized papers were produced, that is the maps, were produced online. You produce it, you print it out, and uh, for the traditional approach, there's no digitized, uh, no digitized paper. Feed map for each PSU are not available. We only use the sketch map, which is being updated by the man, by the feed officer, the mapper, using the, the biro or, or, or pencil as a pencil. Then uh, the open street map is being uploaded using the graded approach. Open street map is being up, up, up uploaded to show features to be updated. And the KLM file is now being uh, is now being used to overlay all the features seen that were observed in the admiration area. As we, we did the gridded area, and it's now being overlaid using the Google Earth to find out whether the PSU has enough residential area or not. Because before you go to the feed, you you need to first confirm the area. Then uh, by the time you now uh, uh, study the, the OSM, the open street map, you'll be able to see if there are residential areas are enough within the area to be conversed. Not on getting to the uh, initiational in, in uh, uh, approach, on getting to the field. At times we find that the area has a, a water, probably there is a stream there, there is river, there is just vast land, which now lead you to adjoining uh, EAs. You start adding other EAs to it to make up for a number of uh, households that are needed to be conversed in that survey. And that creates gaps. Thank you. Let's move to the, to the next. Here, uh, in, in, in both uh, traditional and uh, degraded approach, Data has been, was being collected using uh, the ODK. Open. Okay, I'm back. Using the uh, the ODK open data kit, both uh, the graded approach and uh, the uh, traditional approach use the same ODK. Use ODK, and uh, in the area of uh, coordinates, coordinates were taken by by both the graded and also the traditional approach. Then data quality assurance. Both were uh, both graded at the traditional approach, carried out monitoring and, and, and coordination. Coordinators were used to ensure quality and data integrity. So independent monitors also, were, also, also, also came to observe what happened in the field. And they also wrote their report to assure quality and, and data integrity. In both uh, a traditional and the graded approach, uh, both made sure that uh, monitoring and uh, coordination and independent monitoring were, were observed. Then uh, for the ethics, the graded approach the team made sure that approval was granted by Nigerian government. And the, 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 the vice president launched it. The minister of uh, finance endorsed it. All the ministers came, it was endorsed. So Nigerian government gave it 
granted the graded approach ethics and it was approved for them to cut for the graded approach to cut to to be applied in nigerian uh, system and uh, for the uh, the bureau that conducted it they already have the mandate they already have the mandate to conduct interviews then for the graded approach concept form was shared because it was not compulsory if you if you as 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 a recipient don't want to respond then it's all left for you so concept form was shared for them to to seek their consent before interview was carried out and in, in both states LGA, uh, in the in the, in the states and the edges of a uh, Kaduna state because Kaduna state was uh, the state where we carried out the the pilot so uh, for the uh, for the MMBS since they have the uh, uh, the demand, the, the, the mandates. They only uh, went in into uh, get the, the office introduced, and the consent, uh, the, the consent of the the, the projects, and the service were carried out. So consent forms were issued to respondents, and the cons and their consent granted before household interviews were commenced on the graded approach. The team composition. There was no difference between the team composition. Of the graded approach as well as the composition of uh, of the traditional approach, because we wanted to carry out comparison of both the graded as well as the traditional uh, approach. So all the, the composition of the team, as well as uh, just the composition of the team, as well as the training on traditional approach, were, were also carried out because after the graded approach training. Traditional uh, approach trading was also carried out by, by the Bureau of Statistics on the feed workers right there in Kaduna. And uh, their DSAs and their, uh, take, uh, this thing were taken care of. And although there, there were challenges, there were, there, were, there, there were serious challenges in the area due to insecurity in Kaduna State, but at the end of the day, this, the uh, the survey was a success. On this note, I say thank you all for listening. Thank you, Michael. Also very clear. Thank you, Ruda. Great. Dana, we've got about uh, nine minutes left in our itinerary. We have Dana in the itinerary. Dana was going to give give us another example of uh, additional of a survey that was conducted in Kathmandu. Um, I'd leave it to you, Dana, to think about how to use the nine minutes that remain. <laughs> yeah, I was going to suggest that we could take a few questions for folks that have to leave um, as scheduled. And if it runs over, I can present the Kathmandu study um, after our time has run up. That sounds great. That sounds great. There are some there are some terrific questions. Um, I want to, I guess, highlight one or two to start with. So one is uh, in the Q&A is talking about how do you evaluate for a particular country? Now, when we're thinking about a particular country, what are some of the main considerations for evaluating the best available um, graded population data set? Um, that is an excellent question. I tend to, I would start with the high resolution settlement layer, which is produced by Facebook um, and or Meta, um, or the world pop constrained data. If you don't really know where to start, those two are both um, available for most countries and a good place to start. Um, I recently supported a survey that was focused on like a a population that wouldn't normally end up in a census and therefore doesn't end up getting in incorporated very well into um, gridded population estimates that are based on censuses. And that would be a survey that was based of refugee camps. Um, for that one, there was a local census that had been was being conducted by um, the International Red Cross. And we decided for that particular case that because the International Red Cross Red Crescent was collecting these population counts in refugee camps, we would use that to create a gridded population data set. And the manual actually discusses this use case um, and provides tutorials about how you would do that yourself. 
using um, tools that are available for free through WorldPOP and the Global Human Settlement Layer teams. Um, so that would be in a case where if it's a, it's a very kind of um, newly settled population, it wouldn't be reflected in some of the gridded, the building footprint data that might come out like every year or two, um, and it might not have time to be incorporated. That would be an example of, of creating your own gridded population data set. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. There's another question here saying um, that, that you mentioned the challenge of using gridded population um, approach in uh, areas where the poor connectivity are after uh, humanitarian um, disasters. And the, the, the question poser is saying these tend to be the areas that would perhaps benefit the most from such data. It'd be good to hear what alternatives to suggest or what, 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 what would you suggest for areas where the gridded population data sets have not perhaps caught up to a very recent um, displacement events? That is a good question. Um, similar to what I just said, if you've got, you know, like an international, re some, somebody who's been doing some field counts on the ground of where new populations are settled, you can use those field counts to create gridded population data. Um, other options to consider, the reason, so design four, it says a building simple random sample. Um, and this was a tool, this is based on a tool that's created by Epicentra um, to do building simple random samples based on Google Earth. So if Google Earth imagery or some of the other um, publicly available satellite imagery is capturing the displaced, like the, you know, the landscape after an event has happened, which does, you know, usually that data actually does become available in short time because um, they know that teams will need to respond um, to the a disaster, for example, after an earthquake or a hurricane or something like that. So if that imagery is becoming available um, publicly, you can access it through the GeoSampler tool and do a building simple random sample. Um, and there's guidance again provided in the manual about how to translate a building sample random sample into a population random sample um, by asking a few questions about the number of buildings per household and the number of households in each building. Um, that would be a good option. That would be a good sample design and set of tools to use um, in, in a case of like a very recent displacement. Perfect, thank you. I'm gonna give you one more question and then uh, we'll actually, yeah, let, let's just say a, a few words to people who would want to learn more and where to go for resources to learn more from now. So obviously the manual is launching today. You should go to the manual website and download that. That contains uh, as up to date as possible here on September 28 in 2022 discussion of uh, data sets and recommendations. We acknowledge that things are going to change moving forward that will will, as I mentioned at the top of the call, we want to create a community of practice. We want to have that website be a place where we post updated resources and recommendations. Dana, do you have other suggestions or what's your what's your guidance for someone whose appetite was whetted today? What should they do next? Yep, so check out the document itself. Um, also check out any of the tutorials. So the, what's great about the gridded, what, what I think is great about the manual, and Hoi can jump in if she thinks this as well, but there's decision trees to help you figure out what is your team's skill level um, and what is the survey design that you want to use. And then given some of those parameters, which data sets you might use for a gridded population sample, um, and then links to the actual tutorials that you might wish to use um, in the field for implementing your survey. So we do try to provide very clear a string of guidance um, and that manual is a good place to get started. There are sometimes people who are fairly new to the world of household surveys in general. Um, the manual is not designed to be a, a, an overall orientation to household surveys. However, we do have an appendix that brings you to some very helpful resources that are publicly available um, the demographic and health surveys, the multiple indicator cluster surveys, living standards measurement surveys, the World Health Immunization Surveys. All of these big survey programs have created some remarkable resources to get you started. And so you can go consult those and then come back to the gridded manual if you are a complete novice. <laughs> um, 
And I will say we were changed. I was changing uh, guidance about which gridded population data sets are available and should be used as late as a few weeks ago because there's new data coming online all the time. Um, I think COVID has really propelled us to think about, you know, using big data. There's just a lot more available computing power now, et cetera. And so the building footprints data, the settlements data, the population gridded, the gridded population data derived from those, et cetera, are all under massive developments right now um, by many different teams in the private sector, public sector, academia, government. So we will see uh, better gridded data sets. And as those become available, we can try to use this gridpopsurvey.com website as a space. Um, and then Dale and I have dreams of also starting maybe some sessions at future global conferences where we can actually meet face-to-face -face or you know, connect online in a professional space and share our experiences um, and our own you know, guidance based on all the questions that have come up. So um, please stay tuned to that website. It's at least a good launch point to figure out where we can meet and, and continue fostering this community of practice. And just wanna say thanks to everyone who's um, joined us today. And I'm happy to stay on a few more minutes and, and offer the presentation from Nepal if that works for Hawaii. Absolutely, thank you. I think Dana, you have you capturing, you know what we think is people who have so short uh, attention spans that people don't read long menus. Really encourage everyone to go read the menu and it's really fantastic. And great to hear that you are updating the sources. You are going to continue to update. So many of the people here will be go heading to World Data Forum next uh, in April next year and also the ISI in Canada, all the while Canada. Uh, 2023. I think these be fantastic opportunities to really um, share share what you have right now. Uh, just if you allow me one minute. Um, so our group really facilitates exchange of experiences, innovative approaches. We're there to connect with all the innovations uh, from one side to another. Countries, academia, researchers. So we're a platform that really facilitates that. This is why we were here today. If anyone's interested to be on the mailing list, we only bother you once a month uh, with the events, new resources, training opportunities, new guidance uh, available that's related to household surveys. We are really set, sharing that with our stakeholders and a larger community. So please let me know. And lastly, uh, so our group had been working on a position paper. It's called Positioning Household Survey for the Next Decade. And it's just uh, recently being published and also endorsed by our uh, entire group to use that as a blueprint for us to move forward. And so sampling, of course, is one of the priority areas that we would like to move toward. So if anyone's interested in the paper, uh, let me know. Thank you. Hand over to you, Dana. Great, and I'll try to make this short and sweet. Give me a second to share my screen, sorry. Is that coming through? Dale, is that something you not, can see? Not yet, no. Okay, not yet. I can. Is it coming through go. now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm presenting this on behalf of a very large team that was called the Surveys for Urban Equity Project. It was an academic team um, comprised of six organizations where he did surveys and, and other qualitative work in three countries between 2017 and 2019. Um, you can learn more by following that link to, about the project. And as stated by others, um, the survey context in which we work have changed rap have changed from mostly rural context to now uh, mostly urban and also very dynamic urban settings. So in the past we would have used census enumeration area boundaries, but now we've got these gridded population estimates and satellite uh, imagery and mobile applications and lots of uh, new tools to play with, but we don't always see them incorporated into surveys. And so the design for the surveys by the Surveys for Urban Equity Project were to um, evaluate a two-stage kind of typical survey design with a one-stage area microcensus design. Um, both of them were based on gridded population estimates. So the two stages is, is typical in the sense, um, not in terms of the sample frame, but in just in terms of its implementation. And the, 
the tools, um, the processes, the time, et cetera. There was other surveys conducted in Dhaka and Hanoi. These were targeted to very specific areas of the city. Um, I won't be talking about these today, but the Kathmandu study, was it randomized half of our sample to the two-stage full listing design, half to the one-stage area micro design, and compared them based on design, as well as household definition, I'll explain in a minute. And that's what, um, and it's representative of the entire Kathmandu Valley. Um, we used the WorldPOP unconstrained data. This was the best available at the time of the survey. And we used the grid sample R algorithm that preceded gridsample.org. We sampled 30 clusters for two stage and one stage. Um, we had to replace a few of them and we also had to segment a few of them. When it came to, we did a full household listing um, in the two stage and in the one stage we visited each area and made sure that the um, roads and buildings were updated and open street map. And, but we didn't do a household listing because in one stage area micro census, you essentially list on the day of interview. We had a 97% response, household response rate for the two stage, but only 88% for the one stage. And as I'll, you'll come to see throughout this whole presentation, the reason is in our one stage area micro census design, we were able to identify more vulnerable, um, atypical kind of hidden households and many more cho people chose not to respond or simply weren't available um, after multiple visits during the day. I will talk briefly about household definitions. You, the DHS mix LSMS will use a, a pretty common definition of a usual resident or someone who slept in the dwelling the previous night um, and everyone who shares the roof and living arrangements and meals is part of that household. And the surveys for urban equity, usual resident was part of our definition as well. But we meant where do you usually stay? Like in the last 30 days, where did you sleep most frequently? Was it in the place where you're being interviewed or was it somewhere else? Um, you'll see that this incorporated more people that live, live essentially at their place of work um, in, in, in atypical settings. Um, we also didn't require a roof, which meant that we included street sleepers in the area micro census design for people who slept in the small area that we were interviewing in. So yes, we, we were able to capture more people um, who might be like a shopkeeper who lives in the back of her shop. We also captured people, um, captured is a horrible word, but we also interviewed people who were like medical staff or cleaning staff and essentially lived at offices or clinics um, because they didn't commute home throughout a month at a time. You know, they would actually live at their place of work and just travel home like once every month or, or every two months even. And so we counted them in our surveys for urban equity. They wouldn't normal, normally be included in a typical survey. While hostel dwellers, so people who live in dorm style accommodation, um, would in concept be avail uh, included in a, say a DHS or a mix. Often they're not in practice, but we made sure that they were included. We also included people who stay at guest houses long term. Um, more than 30 days, I think, was the definition we used. And this is all reflecting the, these, the housing crises that are faced in many cities around the world, especially the fastest growing cities in Africa and Asia. There's just not enough housing available. People live in all sorts of new types of arrangements um, and it's increasing proportions of the population. And we're just not, maybe not collecting data from them. Um, the way that we see this play out in the results. So here is a, here's the distribution of our sample by a couple of different indicators. Um, there's a paper reference at the end. Go check out the paper to see all of them. But you'll see that using just um, a typical DHS definition, so not the surveys for urban equity, very loose definition, but our standard definition, you'll see that the two sample designs pulled out different populations. Um, we had smaller households and more households, multi-dwelling, sorry, multi-household dwellings in the one stage household reflecting more hidden population, um, more single adults, more single moms with children, and more uh, non-family type households were showing up in that one stage design. There weren't necessarily differences in terms of migrant status and slum status, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and the differences between a typical two stage design using a typical kind of DHS or mixed household definition 
with the one stage area micro census design and our kind of broader definition of, of who is in a household um, for the surveys for urban equity, you see even greater differences. Um, we definitely picking up more single adults and non family households in the one stage design. A very interesting result that came out of this study was that um, the one stage area micro census design as expected had larger design effect or more similarity between near neighbors um, for demographic characteristics related to family type or marital status, employment, um, or age sex. But we were actually finding smaller design effects in the area micro census design when it came to socioeconomic indicators. And the likely reason is we were picking up more of these hidden households and a lot more um, heterogene heterogeneity was showing up in these very tiny little sampling units of you know, the guard who lives in the shack out back or the, the person who lives in the shop um, on the high street and is also not doing very well. And so you've, you found a lot more economic diversity in the one stage design, which was something we didn't necessarily expect, um, but didn't surprise us when we did find it and is of very big interest for these highly dynamic, fast growing cities like Kathmandu. To summarize some key findings, um, the one stage area micro census design identified more single adults, more single mothers with children and more non-family households. The households tended to be smaller, so more individuals. Um, and the multi-household dwellings were more likely to show up in our area micro census sample because we were able to identify these hidden households. Um, there are more variability in the social economic characteristics per sampling unit. And again, the reason that this is all happening is likely that when our interviewers are going out and spending a lot of time with each of the households that they interview, and then they're going immediately to the next household and the next household in a small area, they have time to build rapport with residents and they're able to discover those hidden households that you wouldn't find in a normal listing activity when you just are briefly at a building and asking who lives here. Um, the answers that you get are always the people who are registered in a formal housing, like a apartments or, or households, and not necessarily the hidden informal households. Neither of these uh, survey arms did a very good job at capturing slums or informal settlements. And this is reflective of a problem that we see across household surveys that Dale kind of mentioned as one of my to topics of um, work at the, at the top of the hour. We don't have a good way to stratify urban spaces, which are super heterogeneous. We have no way to stratify slums from non-slums or deprived from non-deprived areas. And this showed up in, in the surveys for urban equity studies as well. Um, and it might be related to why we didn't see huge social economic differences based on sample design or the household definitions, because we did expect actually that, you know, if you were able to stratify by slum, non-slum and able to do an area micro census design, it would be your best bet of finding hidden, deprived, um, vulnerable households. So we need to stratify based on deprived, not deprived areas. And a few of you had questions around cost. So this is a, this is a bit of a theoretical exercise because like um, Sarah's survey, we actually implemented the two stage full listing and one stage area micro census design at the same time by the same teams. So the cost was just, a, it was more of an estimate here, um, but this was the estimate we came up with with the cheaper for the area micro census design because we were spending less, less on mapping and listing. Um, in this case, that's just where we went out to those areas and did a, an update to the open street map of buildings and roads. These costs would probably get eliminated altogether in other area micro census designs. And um, we had, you know, much smaller sampling units. So you're spending much less time in the field moving around um, in, in between different households. So that's why the costs were lower in the one stage area micro census design. All right, that's the paper and the link if you wanna go check out the full study and more details on the results. And thank you so much again for joining us today. Great, and I just wanna conclude uh, how, how we should have started the time, which is, um, 
expressing our gratitude to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for, first of all, recognizing the need for this manual. They approached us about writing the manual rather than the other way around, which is so often the case. <laughs> so often the, it's the, the other way around. So thanks to the vision of uh, Io Blair Fries and John Vanderhyde for commissioning this work and underwriting it. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dana, Dale, Aaron, Michael, for the great presentations. Mm-hmm.